So if we're image-bearing disciples who are united to Christ, we're living as brothers and sisters in God's family, how are we to live? How are we to live? Let me show you some pictures that I think are helpful. Maybe, you're, are you, anybody visual here, in here? Okay, got some visual folks. I think these pictures are helpful. They're not from, they're not for me. I didn't, I didn't design these, um, but they're from a book called Life with God, or I think the book's just called With, but it's a good book. You should check it out. Um, sometimes we, we live life under God, right? It's kind of like, okay, God's ruler and he's reigning and these are his laws and I got to keep them. I got to make sure I do everything right all the time. And our life with God primarily becomes this relationship of, this is what God's told me to do, and I have to do it. And if I don't do it, like, I'm going to feel the weight of that, right? This is an oppressive way of living. That I constantly have to be appeasing God because nobody has appeased him on my behalf. There's life under God. Every one of these has some, some grain of truth to it, right? That like, yes, we do live life under God, but all of them are kind of the extremes of this. Like this way of living right here is a way of just saying that life under God is really just mostly about his rule and reign. And I got to do what he says all the time. Life under God. Life from God. This is God is just divine gift giver, right? Now, does God give good gifts? Absolutely he does. But is God just like a, you know, a, uh, like a genie, Santa Claus, Right? Snack machine, where it's just like, here we go. This is what I need right now. Let me punch in the code and let me get the Hershey's bar or whatever you eat. Um, uh, just divine gift giver. This is what I need from you, God. Give it to me now. And I'll do what I need to do to get it. Like, do I need to impress you? Do I need to do this or this or that? I'll do that. But primarily I'm coming to you because I want something from you. It's not you. I want something from you. Life over God. This is where a lot of times we're like, okay, listen, I don't really need you. Maybe some applications of this are people are like, I'll keep buying into this because it, like, it's okay or it's what my family does or whatever, but ultimately I'm kind of in control of our relationship. You get as much of me as I want to give to you, and I can take as much from you as I want to take. So it's not even like you're coming to God to get gifts any longer. You're really saying, I am in control of my life. I don't need much. And if I do need you for something, I'll let you know. Life for God. This is, I've got a gift and I'm going to give it back to God. This is probably, probably among, you know, Christians that jump into a church plant. This might be a way that we slip into thinking a lot of times. Is ultimately, like, this is really about what I can do for God. Right? Right? Like, there's something to be done. I want to help. Let me help you. I want to do this for you, right? And again, all of these have, a, all of them except maybe life over God, have a grain of truth to them, right? But yes, we are under God's rule and reign. Yes, God does give good gifts. Yes, we do want to lay those gifts back at the feet of God, our resources, our time, our energy. But ultimately, the story of Scripture and our relationship with God is not calling us to life under, over, from, or for God. It's calling us to life with God to make our home in and with God, right? This is what the story of Scripture is, is not primarily do something for me or take something from me or come to me for good gifts, right? Or live under my rule and reign. It's primarily make your home with me. That's what we talked about with union with Christ. God creates Adam and Eve. Why? So that he could dwell with them in the garden. God wants to be with you. Not because he lacks something, but because he is abundant in desire and delight. And out of the overflow of that delight, he wants to share in that delight with you. God wants to be with his people. You could read the whole story of Scripture, and I think it's faithful, to say God wants to make his home with his people. And he's inviting us in to make our home with God. This is what life with God looks like. And so what does it mean for us to have life with God together? So I, I, I told you we talk about our values, and so that's what we're going to talk about. We're talking about grow together, give together, go together. So grow together. These are the habits of grace. This is how we walk with the Lord together. Habits of grace, sometimes they're called spiritual disciplines or habits of holiness. It's our gathered and our scattered practices. It's how we walk with the Lord together. These habits of grace that we're going to talk about, habits of holiness, are not how we maintain union with God. It's how we cultivate intimate communion with God. Okay? Union with God is unbreakable and shakable. Why? Because it's secured and sealed by God himself. 
Our communion with God is something that we cultivate as we draw near to God through habits of grace and habits of holiness. We don't maintain our, you don't maintain your union with God. God maintains your union with God, and that's a good thing. Because if you maintain it, if I maintained it, we'd lose it, right? I can't keep my car keys. I would definitely lose my spiritual and visible union with God. But our habits of holiness, habits of grace, are how we cultivate intimate communion with God. And this is important because our love for one another and for the world will never go deeper than our love for the Lord. Our love for one another and our love for the world, that's never going to go deeper than our love with and for the Lord. That's the point A. That's why we started with the gospel. That's why we're starting with grow together. What does it mean to grow together? It means to hear his voice. It means to have his ear. And it means to love one another. Like if you're just thinking about how would you summarize growing together, it would be hear his voice, have his ear, love one another. Hear his voice. In a sea of other voices, we have to regularly return to listening to the voice of God. Regularly return to listening to the voice of God. We do that primarily by encountering God as he has revealed himself in his word. Bible reading, Bible study, meditation on scripture, memorization of scripture. I like to say that you need both Bible reading and Bible studying to hear his voice. Bible reading is breadth. It's water running over rocks. The rocks are being formed, but you don't see it real quick, right? Bible reading is you're reading your Bible, right? Maybe with somebody else or by yourself, with your family. It's breadth. It's slow formation over years and years and years. Bible study, it's like digging a well, right? Bible reading, it's like water running over rocks, going to form you slowly. Bible study, it's like I'm digging a well here, right? It's more focused. It's more intentional. We need both. Meditation. What is meditation? It's exploring the treasures of who God is and what he has done. It's exploring those things. It's considering them. It's really thinking through, okay, I know God is holy, but what does that mean? What has he said about his holiness? What are the implications of his holiness? It's kind of sitting, it's savoring. That's what meditation on scripture is. It's savoring. You ever have a meal that like you really enjoy, you don't want the taste to go away? That's meditating on scripture. It's like, man, I want to savor this. Memorization, you know what that is? It's just storing that away. Just storing that away. Taking what we're kind of learning in meditation, what we're savoring, and going, let's, let's store that. Let's keep that. I want to keep that close to me. So hear his voice, but not just hear his voice, we have his ear, right? It can be tempting to look for hope and help everywhere and forget to turn to the king of the whole world. But we have the ear of God as God's people, which means we can come to God in prayer. And why do we pray? Well, we pray because God is great. God is gracious. God is glorious and God is good. We come to God because he's all of those things. And we want to bring our needs before him. How do we pray? Well, God teaches us how to pray, the ministry of Jesus, right? To the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. To the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we pray. We pray to God the Father through the Son, because we are coming to the Father in the Son, because we're united with Christ. And we pray, why? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Spirit prays for us with groanings too deep for words, because we don't even know how to pray. Have you been in one of those moments where you feel like you didn't even know what to pray? You didn't even know how to pray? how to verbalize what you really needed, those dark days, those dark hours, the Spirit steps in and intercedes for us. And so we hear his voice, we have his ear, but we love one another. There are 59 one another's in the New Testament. It feels like there's a thousand of them. There are 59. A few examples, be at peace with one another, Mark 9. Wash one another's feet, John 13. Love one another, John 13 and John 15. A lot, it says it a lot. Honor one another above yourselves, Romans 12. Carry each other's burdens, Galatians 6.2. The big picture here is that we can't practice any of these things. We can't hear his voice. We can't have his ear. We can't love one another without two key things, presence and humility. Presence and humility. You cannot hear his voice, have his ear, and love one another without presence and humility. Presence and attention, I think, is the greatest gift that we have to give to those around us. It is arguably one of the most countercultural things that you can demonstrate in this day and age, is to be with somebody. Not to be everywhere, but to be with somebody, right? Do you ever see how rare it is just to be looked at, to be seen, to be acknowledged? If we won't cultivate times to be present with the Lord and hearing his voice, 
having his ear and loving one another, we can't do any of this. We have to show up. We have to be there. We have to focus our heart's attention on listening to God, speaking to God, loving one another, listening to one another, speaking to one another. Presence is required for this. You know what else is required? Humility. Humility. Humility is required because we are acknowledging when we give ourselves over to hearing the voice of God or speaking to God or loving one another, we're acknowledging it's not about me. My life is not about me. This world is not about me. I'm giving this away because all of this is not about me, right? I'm being interrupted right now. Why? Because this is not about me. I'm going to initiate with this other person, or I'm going to create time to be with the Lord. Why? Because my life, my schedule, my time, it's not about me, right? That's what it looks like to grow together. What does it look like for us to give together? Well, it begins by acknowledging that our life is not our own. There's no such thing as mine. Mine doesn't exist. It's a convenient fiction because we need it for, you know, people to not trespass on your property and stuff, but mine is not a It's not a reality for us. It's not a reality for anybody, but Christians are those who confess that it's not really ours. Our life is not our own. Psalm 24, 1, right? God is great. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. It's all his. And he gives us stewardship over certain things. Because of this profound reality, we're free to give our lives away. Why? Because they're not our lives. It's not our life. It's not your time. It's not your money. It's not my time. It's not my money, right? It's not my research. It's not my gifts. It's not my skills. What does it look like to give your life away? Well, we're talking about it in three different ways. Service, generosity, hospitality. What service? Well, it's just using time, energy, gifts, and skills for the life of the church and the life of the world. Using time, energy, gifts, and skills for the life of the church and life of the world. Some of you have already jumped in and started doing this. And when you're planting a church, you kind of need every skill set, every gift set, right? It's like nothing is built. <laughs> so you're like, well, what do you do? Because I'm sure whatever you do, we could use. Like we probably have a need for, okay? Service is just using your time, energy, gifts, skills for the life of the church and life of the world. When we think about serving in the life of the body or in the life of our community, there's really two different ways we can think about that. Think about needs, and then we can talk about wiring or skills or gifts, right? Needs. We serve sometimes in areas that it's not like we're like the masters in, but just because there's need there. And everybody will be called on in the life of this church to just meet some needs. Like it's not going to be glamorous, and you might go, well, it doesn't match my Myers-Briggs. We're just going to have to go, okay, I mean, somebody has to do it, and it's going to be us. We're going to be doing it together. Children's ministry is going to be one of those things. We're just going to have to own together and go, listen, maybe you're not great with kids, right? We go, okay, let's give you a responsibility in that environment that is as far away from kids as you can be, but still working with children's ministry, okay? It's going to be an all-hands-on-deck situation. So there are going to be needs. We'll all be called on to serve the body and the world in ways that may be outside of our skills, giftings, and desires, but they're needed. But they're needed. Help Your Neighbor Day is a great example. I am the least handy person you've ever met. I'm just not good at it. So when Scott was like, dude, let's do Help Your Neighbor Day, I immediately thought, this is the intersection of the two things I am worse at, which is being outside and working with my hands. (laughs) I don't excel in either of those two environments. But I didn't go, you know, it's not really really my thing. It's like, okay, I got to lean into this. There are needs. We can step out to meet needs. A lot of you did that. But then there are also gift skills. We want to help develop and release leaders to run in their gifting and their skills in the life of the church and life of the world. Maybe you're a woman who's like, man, I've really wanted to learn, to, uh, like to become a better teacher of the Bible. Great. We want to develop you to be a better, uh, we, well, I want the strongest female Bible, Bible teachers in the country, okay? Like we want to develop and we want to give you all the resources, connect you with the right networks, get you in the right place to develop you as somebody who wants to teach the Bible. Maybe you're somebody who says, listen, I really love event planning. And, and I feel like I want to do that. Like, can I help plan events? It's like, great. You can help plan events. We would love to know that. Maybe you're somebody who's saying, like, I really want to lead a gospel community, but I feel like I have some developmental needs. I want to do that, though. It's like, great. We want to develop you to do that. We want to take your desire and help develop and release you. So there's two different ways that serving manifests itself. What about generosity? Well, generosity is, if serving is using our stuff, or using who we are, our stuff, what we have, 
Generosity is just giving our resources away for the life of the church and the life of the world. Just giving our resources away. It's not just money, though money is always a great depiction of it because money is always the hardest thing to give away, it seems. Money and time. Money and time. But generosity means that we're open-handed with time, with money, with resources that we have, right? An example of this would be, are we willing to invest what is hardest to give away to do what the Lord is calling us to do in Richardson, our country, and the world? Are we willing to give time away? Are we willing to make time? You do not have time right now. I know you don't because I know, I know you. You do not have time to plant a church. You don't. You don't have time. Are you going to give time away to plant a church? You don't have the time right now. It's not budgeted for. I know it's not. It's not budgeted for in my calendar. You have time to give away. Will you make time to give away to plant a church? Time is hard to give, almost as hard to give as money or resources. Generosity, open-handedness. We can be open-handed, why? Because God's great. He's in charge of everything. He's good. Uh, We can trust him when we give away things, right? He's glorious. He satisfies our deepest needs. And he's gracious. We've got good news to tell. Like, we want to give away because everything belongs to him, and it goes to telling more about his good grace and mercy and giving thanks to him. And then hospitality, opening up our lives and our homes for the life of the church and the life of the world opening up our homes and our lives. It's inviting people in. That's what hospitality is. Examples are hosting dinners, hosting neighborhood block parties, hosting cookouts, inviting people into the rhythms of your life. Do you work out? Maybe think about bringing somebody with you to work out, right? Do you walk? Maybe bring somebody with you to walk, right? Do you, are you guys going to be playing YMCA soccer? Invite somebody else in your neighborhood to play on your YMCA soccer team. I don't know what it is you do, but this is the intersection point right here. Hospitality is not just, are you willing to host somebody? It's, are you willing to open your life up, right? It's, are you willing to open your life up? Because it's not really yours, right? Let me, let me just give one really, like, I think this is a good point to mention something that we haven't got to talk a lot about. We're hoping that, that our church, that Mosaic, will one day look like the community. We are. We don't currently. We hope that it will one day. Our gathering will only be as diverse as your dinner table is. Mosaic is not, we don't have some strategy. There's not a plan. We want to talk about racial reconciliation. We want to talk about God's heart for the nations and God's heart for our community. But we will look like who you hang out with. There's a lot of talk right now about wanting churches that are diverse and not wanting homes that are diverse. That's opposite. Are you with me? We... We don't have a plan in place to look like our community. The plan is us living our lives together in the neighborhoods in this community that we're in, inviting people that don't look like us into our homes, engaging, initiating with people that don't look like us in our lives. That's, that's how we move forward in this. It's not, there's, not a, there's no book written about how to do it. There are books written about like, hey, this is how you should do it, and none of them are right. Hospitality, opening up our lives. So we grow together, we give together, we go together. Like I said last night, you will be a missionary for whatever has captured your heart. Your missionary status is not a question. You are a missionary. You will be a missionary for whatever has captured your heart. You're going to proclaim it. We are worshipers by nature, and it just spills over, right? I don't know how many people told me A Quiet Place was the best movie they had seen all year. It was great. Those people were missionaries for A Quiet Place. I went to see Quiet Place, even though I don't really love John Krasinski. I went to see it because people were like, uh, man, this movie's incredible. I went because other people told me the good news of A Quiet Place. Okay? I'm glad I went. It was a great movie. It was not a waste of my time or my money. But you share whatever's captured your heart. Our imaginations are always one before our minds are. Right? Whatever you're communicating, it will capture the attention of other people. Romans 9.3, Paul says, I could wish that I, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Listen to that. Paul in Romans 9.3 is saying, he, he's saying hypothetically, if I could give up my salvation, which is the nearest and dearest thing to Paul, certainly, as, the, as his writings demonstrate, Paul's saying, if I could give it up so that other people could have it, I would. He's saying, I can't, but if that's what it took, I would give it up. So that, is that kind of burden characterize our lives? for the lost people in our community. For I could wish myself accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Could you say that? 
about your neighbors? Did you say that about who they are? Does that burden characterize your life for your neighbors, for your kids, for the people that you work with, for the people that you work out with, for the people that you walk with, for the people you eat and drink with? Would God give us a burden for the losses in our world? How do we go together? Well, disciple-making, which we've talked a lot about. Last two things here, and then I'm going to give you some time to process. Partnering for impact. We want to take on strategic partnerships at the local and global level to focus our giving and our going. So we are prayerfully evaluating, Rachel, to get to your question, we're prayerfully evaluating local and global partners right now, the board is, with the hope to announce partnerships with two to three local and one to two global partners in early 2019, okay? We want to make a two-year commitment to those local and global partnerships because I think that's what it takes. I think to say, we're going to partner with you for this next year is not enough. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't give enough time for our people to understand what's going on. It doesn't give enough time for us to see our people get involved in those spaces, to see the result there. And so we want to find strategic partners, not 10 or 12 partners, but two to five partners that we could say we are investing in these people and that we're calling our people to invest in locally and globally. It's not to say that, we, that you can't invest in whatever you want to invest in. Listen, you, you do that. We're just going to say as a church, this is where we're putting the disproportionate amount of our time, energy, and resources for local and global partnership for these next two years, and we'll reevaluate it at that point. We want to make a two-year commitment to financial giving to these partners and urge our people to consider giving and going with them. We want them to have opportunities, not just for us to send our finances to them and our people's finances to them, but also to send our people to them to partner and to serve in those environments. So this is what we're prayerfully evaluating. You can pray for us because there's a lot of good local and global partners. So we're really trying to see like, what aligns with our vision and what are strategic partnerships where we can have disproportionate impact. If we try to do 10 or 12 things here, because we're going to be small and lean, we won't really feel the impact of any one of them. Does that make sense? You understand this. We want to have some meaningful partnerships. To do that, we have to focus our energy. Not forever, but for a little while. Planting and missions. We want to plant churches. End of sentence. Where? Here, there, everywhere. As leaders emerge, we want to cultivate leaders. We want to plant churches. Some of those planters might be you. I'm hoping, praying that some of them are you. Maybe one of your children. Or maybe somebody that we don't even know yet who's going to come to faith in the life of Mosaic and that four or five years, six, seven years from now, we're going to plant them. Maybe here. Maybe somewhere else in the Metroplex. Maybe somewhere else in the country. Maybe across the world. We want to plant churches. We want to send missionaries. Where? Specifically to unreached people groups. We want to work with the IMB and pioneers and new frontiers and new tribes and any organization that wants to send missionaries to unreached people and send missionaries to unreached people. We want to tell prospective missionaries, if you want to be developed and cultivated and resourced, come here to our body. We want to care for you, develop you, and send you to unreached people so that we can see you plant churches among unreached people groups. So when we go together, we're thinking about in terms of disciple-making, partnering for impact, and planting in missions. And so I want to pause here. We're going to do some Q&A from 12 to 1 during the lunch hour, but I want us to take some time because it has been a lot, hasn't it? Yesterday and today, it's a lot. I know it's a lot in a short amount of time. So I want to give you the next 35 minutes to process this, okay? When was the last time you had 35 minutes to just be by yourself, Right? So it's a, I hope you see it as a gift and not as a hurdle. I want to end the session by giving you this 35 minutes back. At your table, you're going to find two things. Let me explain them to you. First one is you're going to find two prayer cards per person at your table. They look like this right here. We'd love for you to fill out two prayer cards and write the same information on both. Your name, how we can pray for you. We're going to pray for you. It's one of the things that pastors do is we pray for people. We want to pray for you specifically. And then I want you to write down, who are you praying will encounter Christ? Who are you praying will encounter Christ? And you can write down anybody on here. You write down somebody in your neighborhood, somebody you've met, somebody you work out with, somebody you work with, somebody in your family, a friend, somebody. We just want you to write that person's name down on both cards, all the same information. We want you to take one home with you and put it in a place that you can see. Like, the place you can see. Because we want you to start tracking how, what are you praying for that the Lord will do in your life? Because if we don't keep a remembrance of that, we just never see it when it happens. So we want you to be praying, and we want to be praying for you and being able to ask about it. We also want you to be praying for somebody specifically. If you don't have somebody here, don't be ashamed of that. Just write down, would you, would you pray that, somebody, that God would place somebody in my life or my heart? You can write that down, and we'll join you in praying that God will create a space, a place, a person, 
for you to be able to share the gospel with. So if there's not somebody that immediately comes to mind, just pray, would you, would you pray that God would give me an opportunity or that somebody would come to mind or that I would be able to meet somebody engaged? And so that's the prayer card. The other thing here is this rhythm of life guide, okay? So this rhythm of life guide um, is something that I have been practicing for the last year. And I would just say a rhythm of life or a rule of life has been, um, it's been a game changer for me. I just, I can't tell you, this is not like a, a mystic thing. It doesn't have to be. Um, it's just a way of beginning to think through, man, what does my life with God look like? Like, what are the rhythms of that? And so let me just open it up, and I want to walk you through it real quick, and then I'm going to give you the time. There's a brief description of what a rhythm of life is. It's a structure, structure or pattern for our lives that enable, enables us to pay attention to God in everything that we do. We all have a rhythm of life, but most of the time it's unconscious. The purpose of crafting this rhythm is to more effectively structure our time in order to be open to God in all aspects of our daily life. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to write down everything you currently do that nurtures your spirit, fills you with delight. Okay? So for me, this might be something like um, sitting in the hammock with my daughter. Like, we have a hammock in the backyard. Whenever I sit with my daughter in the hammock for 20 or 30 minutes, I walk away going, man, I feel really full. Okay? Step two, write down the activities you need to avoid, limit, or eliminate that pull you away from remaining anchored in Christ. A real practical example of this might be staying up late. Like, man, if I stay up late, then the next morning, you know what I don't do? Get up and focus my heart on the Lord. It might be, uh, this is, man, we really, if we have three nights a week where we've got something going on, that's maximum capacity. We're redlining. Maybe for your home, it's five nights. Uh, Maybe it's six nights. For me, it's like two, (laughs) right? If I have two nights where something big is happening, like, I feel like, man, that's really hard. So if we hit three or four, so that may be a practical thing. Okay, we need to avoid booking every night of the week to do something, okay? Step three, what are the challenging have-tos in this season of your life that impact your rhythms? Here are some examples they have. Caring for aging parents, a special needs child, demanding season at work, parenting small children, amen? An illness, right? A stomach bug, roses, you know what I'm talking about. Right? What are the challenging have-tos in this season of your life that impact your rhythms? What are the things that you just like, you have to do this, right? Maybe it's like, you know, I'm in a season of work, and it is a season. Not that like I only work, I've, oh, I've been working 80 hours for the last two years. That's not a season. That's a, like you are now willfully submitting your life to working 80 hours a week. We can talk about that later. But talking about, man, this is a challenging season at work. Not like, my, yeah, you get what I'm saying. What are the have-tos? Step four, fill in the rule of life worksheet. This is where you take those things from step one and you prioritize them. That's where you prioritize them. Just write down, man, okay, if I can't do everything, but I have to do the have-tos, right? You'd write down the have-tos here. Go, okay, have-tos. What are my have-to relationships and work? But then what are the things from step one that I really want to be a part of my life in worship and rest in relationships and work, Right? Maybe at work, it's like, man, I really love getting time with older coworkers. Like, like, I love getting time with older mentors in my field. And when I do that, I really am full and I go back more charged. That's a really simple example of this. Maybe for relationships, you look at your prayer card and go, man, I don't have anybody that could write down here that I would really want to see encounter Christ. It's like, man, I'd really like to maybe meet a neighbor right? Or meet somebody at the gym that I work out with. Or I know there's this guy at work who's new and I'd like to engage with him or this woman uh, at, uh, you know, in our neighborhood that's new. I see her pushing her shoulder and I'd love to uh, engage with her, whatever. That's what you do. You prioritize in step four these areas of worship, rest, relationships, work. Step five, which aspect of your rule is God calling you to focus on in this season? Like what are the What's the biggest thing that you feel like, I'm focusing in on this? And then step six is just some diagnostics questions. And then at the end, there's just some things to remember as you go through this. This is something we're starting today. It's not something we're finishing today. You don't turn these in. There's not like a report card on this. We're just kicking this off. We're introducing it, okay? Part of the homework for post-launch team is to finish this out. (music) 